Hey, what's happening, everybody? This is Connor McCann, and this is not an episode of Brain Drain. To be honest, I don't know how this one's going to turn out, so let's just get into it. No context, the opposite of what I usually do. This is kind of the opposite of what I usually do, too. When I have a video in mind, I usually have have it very well planned out. If it's like the topic I just did about Pat Finucan, rest in peace, if it's a topic of that magnitude, of that personal importance to me, you're damn right. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that comes out as factually accurate, as just respectful and just good. Like I want something like that to be good. So I'll plan it. I'll write a script for it. I'll do a lot of research, even something like uh, Pat Finucane's situation. There's a lot about that experience I already understand. There's a lot I know. There's a lot about what happened in Northern Ireland and just having personal experience with somebody who went through all that. There was still a lot that I need to confirm and, well, I wouldn't say a lot, but there's still things I need to confirm and there's a certain, like I said, just a certain mentality I have when I'm doing something like that. Usually when I'm doing something like this, like a personal story or just kind of riffing on a topic, there's no script. I might have some idea of what I'm going to talk about. And I mean, if it's about learning how to ride a bike at eight years old and having a crackhead mentor me through the process. I don't really need a script for that. Like I still, I still remember that pretty well, but for something like this, that I'm going to talk about, this is a replacement topic. So as I stated at the beginning of the Pat Finucane episode, I was going to do an episode or just a video about why I stopped rapping. Ultimately why I started rapping, my interest in hip hop. Oh, just, I was going to tell that story. And After recording it, I really didn't feel right about it, and I'm not going to get into why. I just didn't. It's not the right time for that story, so we'll put that one on the shelf. But I still wanted to talk about hip-hop. Hip-hop's central to my life and has been since I was a really young child, and I felt like hip-hop needed its due. And I've participated in all the elements, all four elements of hip-hop, I participated in them at some time. The first one I participated in was breakdancing. So when I went to fifth grade, I changed schools and I went to Paul Revere for fifth grade. I got introduced to breakdancing there. There was a dude from my neighborhood named Jensen. Shout out to Jensen. He, in addition to being a really cool guy, phenomenal breakdancer, 10 year old kid, Filipino kid, pretty much all the kids that, that were breakers at that school were Filipino. When I went to Aptis for middle school, pretty much all the breakers were Filipino. I thought it was some shit Filipinos just came up with. <laughs> and uh, when I started to do my knowledge on hip hop, I, I uh, ultimately I learned that that was not the case. But I've been listening to hip hop since I was six years old. I grew up in a neighborhood where everybody listened to hip hop. The the being like white in that neighborhood. I'm not going to say it was non-existent, but in Bernal Heights, some parts of Bernal Heights, even then, uh, that's all white people up near the top of the the hill. That's all white folks. But in my part, Cortland Avenue, not, not really there. It not, like I said, not uncommon, but the minority. So I would hear hip hop all day. I would hear hip hop passing by in cars. I would hear it, you know, at school, kids would bring radios, things like that. And my introduction to it And why I ultimately wanted to talk about this whole subject with rapping, I really wanted to just talk about hip-hop. And hip-hop has meant the world to me forever. There's a period of time I didn't listen to hip-hop for a couple years. It was after uh, Notorious B.I.G. was killed, rest in peace. After him and Tupac died and the music got really friendly and uh, get along and shiny suity. And obviously it, it wasn't all like that. But to a 13-year-old kid that isn't really too deep into anything else other than like MTV and what I hear in the Bay Area, because I had access to everything in the Bay Area. And we had a very rich and still do have a very rich musical scene. And I was privy to that from the jump. But I grew up sitting next to my sister, who's three years older than me, just watching videos. She was into hip hop first. She put me onto it. I listened to it. I loved it. That's that was what we listened to at school when an episode of uh, In Living Color or something like that came out. 
if <laughs> if someone uh, quoted a joke or something from it and you didn't know what they were talking about, you're straight square. Like, you're a lame-ass dude. Like, oh, man, you don't watch it in living color. Oh, you're a bitch. Like, well, your parents don't let you watch it. You know, just like that, you're not cool. So I wanted to be up on everything, everything that was coming out. Like, I remember listening to The Chronic the first time. My friend, he had a much older sister, so she already had it on tape. Things like that, like listening to Doggy Style for the first time. Even just the first time I stood outside and stood on a corner with two friends and we just had a radio and we listened to Too Short, I'm a player. Like, stuff like that. That's what I live for. Breaking was part of that. And that stayed with me. So a couple years later, I'm 12 years old at this time. Now, mind you, I'm not going to talk about rapping. But like I said, I have done every element of hip hop. Breakdancing, DJing, rapping, and graffiti, all of them. And I can tell you when I've done those things. Breakdancing, fifth and sixth grade, obsessed with it. Same time I was doing martial arts, obsessed with it. Not good at it, not whatsoever. Uh, even earned a friend of mine an ass whooping because of it. Shout out to Marshawn. Hey, my bad, dude. Like, <laughs> he, he, he lived over on Bradford in the neighborhood in Bernal Heights. And me and him were on and off again, cool with each other. But the last time I saw him, all love. And uh, I got a lot of good memories with the dude. So we were breaking his living room. And I remember it. The back of my foot, I got big ass feet. Even as a kid, I had big ass feet. The back of my foot knocked on his mom's glass table. It lifted up off the ground, kind of traveled a couple feet, and then bow, right on the ground. And the first thing we heard was, I know that ain't my glass table. And it was. And <laughs> she, she told me straight up, uh, Marshawn's mom told me straight up, I'm about to whoop his ass. I'm assuming your mom is going to whoop your ass for that shit, right? And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, so I'm not going to have to call her. Like, she's going to just do it when you tell her. Yeah, absolutely. Wasn't going to happen. Uh, one, I wasn't going to tell my mom shit. But <laughs> two, she didn't even, I mean, she she knew my mom from uh, karate. But uh, it's not like they were super close or anything. I don't even know if she had her phone number. So she wasn't going to confirm it. She was going to fuck her son up. And she did. And... Shout out to Marshawn, because he never held it against me. But we were breakdancing in the living room, doing dumb shit like that. Like, that was all the time. DJing, I started DJing a little bit. I'm not even going to act like I was really um, doing it like that, because I wasn't. Right after I moved to North Carolina. Very briefly, I still... I mean, I'm not DJing shit right now, but I still have an interest in it. And, uh, you know, I put out something, it was fairly well received. So that avenue is still open. As far as rapping goes, like I said, I'm not going to tell the story, but I will give you guys the timeline. That was when I was 18 until I was about 20. So I'm not going to get into why and the how and the this and the that, but that's that timeline. As for graffiti, it started... When I was 12 years old and eighth grade was just about to start. So prior to this, I had always been kind of fascinated with, I guess you can call them movements, street movements, collections of people, people coming together for a reason. Like it's always fascinated me. And I used to see it in the neighborhood and I would see it at school as well. And the first time I ever saw a group of people, a group of kids, a group of boys come together for anything, I don't remember... I think it was the 69 boys. There was kind of a lot of those like booty bass groups that were out at that time. And shout out to the booty bass people. Like I only really understood the value of that when I was much older. And I was like, damn, when I was booty bass, like age appropriate. Oh my God. I, was, yeah, I, I wasn't booty basing it up and I should have been. But regardless of that, I think the 69 boys were or something 420 south i don't know there's like i said there was a lot of groups like that at the time coming out of atlanta they had the song the tootsie roll and one of the things that they say in the song is this ain't the butterfly like that was a, a dance this is a tootsie roll and this they kind of looked the same but they were like nah fuck that this is the tootsie roll it was a big song 
So in um, in San Francisco, Bay Area, it's so diverse. The radio stations have to cater to a lot of different types of people. And they would play a lot of dance music. So dance music to me and to a lot of other people was equal in terms of popularity and standing and respect to hip hop. Like we would listen to them. The only shit we weren't really fucking with was like rock music. And a lot of people were still fucking with it on the low and then go to school and just talk shit about it all day. But there was one student. He was really fucking with the Tootsie Roll. Like he, he was he was openly just like putting his allegiance out there. And I saw him by the time he was a kid named Darius. And uh, we used to call him Rel, Relly Rel. Uh, dude out of Lakeview, shout out to Rel. Uh, <laughs> just like, like I said, I could just think of the dude and just start cracking up. He was, he was a hilarious dude. This day, he was walking around the schoolyard talking about, nah, this ain't the butterfly, this is the Tootsie Roll. He was, it was like he was banging on people with the Tootsie Roll. And then, then it wasn't like he was banging on people. He was banging on people because he'd walk up to people and be like, hey, what's up? What do you do? You do the butterfly or you do the Tootsie Roll? And if you said butterfly, you got jumped. <laughs> like fools, fools are getting jumped over doing the butterfly. Like, I remember being drunk as hell one night in, like, maybe 2009 doing the butterfly in the club. They, they should have fucked me up for that. It said these poor kids at Aptis in, like, 1995. But that, that was, like, the first move. And he had, like, 10 or 15 people with him jumping people over the Tootsie Roll. That was the first time I ever saw something like that. Not long after that, and I think I, think I touched on this, or I might have even talked about it. Just in the episode about my friend Ronnie, rest in peace, Ronnie Look, uh, who was killed. I talked about encountering the Norteños. So that was the second time I saw a street movement. I saw collections of people, especially hanging out, seeing people like on 24th Mission. You see that all the time. You see people walking up and down Cortland all the time. Like they got a common dress code. People were wearing a lot of 49er jerseys. Dudes had long hair pulled into ponytails. They wear beanies, like black beanies. Or a hat with the ponytail. Uh, The Niners jersey. I mean, that got kind of hot to wear. And by hot, I mean like the cops would be on you or the Sudanos would be on you. That got kind of too hot to wear to just be like like that open. Especially once the cops put the, um, they put a gang injunction on 24th Emission and said you couldn't hang out there anymore. I didn't really see the colors too heavy after that. And, And it makes sense, but... I would see them. Nobody's messing with them. Obviously, I don't see when they get banged on by the other side or when the other side comes by and shoots or just the, the, the little trivial, awful things that happen in the commission of gangbanging. I didn't get to see any of that. Thank God. I wasn't living that life. I wasn't privy to it. So I stayed out. So I got to see the stuff that seemed cool to me. Particularly, it seemed kind of structured. It seemed like there was an association. Everybody was on the same page. Everybody was representing the same thing. Guys are wearing the same colors. I mean, it's the same for like kids that grow up looking up to the police or firefighters or the military. Not in the sense of like I'm saying uh, (laughs) the Nortenos uh, benefit society or save lives or any of those things. I'm not I'm not going to say all that. I'm not going to say anything about them. That's that's not my place to uh, to do all that. But what I will say is that when you're growing up, looking up to people who look confident who have a dress code, it's almost like they have a uniform on. They're organized. Some kids are going to look up to that and be like, either that's interesting or I want to be a part of that. I was more so that that's interesting type of kid. But then again, what ended up happening, start eighth grade. So I have a story coming up at some point uh, where I talk about getting 100 stitches in a day. That was the day before eighth grade. So eighth grade... Uh, was off to a pretty ominous start. Seventh grade fucking sucked. <laughs> like, seventh grade at Everett, it was tough times. It was tough times. I got into a lot of shit. A lot of people brought a lot of shit to my table. Uh, I wasn't a fan of being there. I had to duck a lot of shit. I'm like, hey, we're about to jump you after school? All right, I, I got to learn how to bust the evasive move as like a 11-year-old, 12-year-old. So I'm already learning how to maneuver out there, just getting from point A to point B. That's, that's dangerous enough when you're small. Like, I was really skinny. Uh, I stuck out. Like, 
for a kid like me, namely a white kid, the assumption is we all got a bunch of money. And uh, I can almost guarantee I've been robbed three times in my life. I'm pretty sure the people that robbed me, the other kids that robbed me, all had more shit than I did. But I, that was a peril for me. The gang shit was a peril because I'm still, like, where I live is still the other side. And if somebody sees me and says, oh, that fool kicks it over there or that fool kicks it with that person. Seeing with the wrong person and the wrong person sees it, pfft, I could be dead for that. So I'm already starting to be street conscious, street efficient. Start eighth grade when I finally do go to school. I see that a lot of my friends are starting to get into graffiti. So I had one friend named Ed. Shout out to Ed. I had two friends named Bobby. Bobby R and Bobby H. Shout out to them. Cool ass dudes. Fucking super cool ass dudes now. Like a bunch of people in Holly Courts. Too, really too many to name, but those were the main people that I knew. Uh, the homeboy Nam, shout out to him. Uh, the homeboy Samang, shout out to him. Uh, Narith and Narun, shout out to them. Like, there's a lot of people that were getting into it at that time. And these were guys, some of these guys I'd known since I was like, like six or seven years old. So we'd always been solid, like play handball with each other you know, ride bikes or play at the park. Like we organized a big uh, like water fight together. You know, we used to just do stuff like that. So I would be over there. I, I, I would just be over there from a pretty young age. I'd be at the courts from like seven or eight uh, onward. And uh, a crew had started in the neighborhood called HTS, Hit the Streets. And a lot of people that we knew uh, were a part of that. A lot of those guys, we, I'm not going to say that they became a part of it because that's up to them to uh, declare. But a side little click of that was formed and it was called PBH, Pimps Be Hacking. And if you're wondering, hey, Connor, what the fuck does that mean? Because I speak English and those are all words I understand, but they don't make any fucking sense together uh, in that sequence. So you know what? I understand. Let, let me translate. We definitely weren't pimps, but... San Francisco, Oakland, it's a hub of pimping. All of us have seen pimps around. We've all seen prostitutes around. A major prostitute strip. Cap Street is 15 minutes away by foot. So we're, we're familiar, and it was something held in high regard. So we're, we were like, hey, we're pimps. We're Max. Stuff like that. Cool guys. Ladies love us. B, obviously B. So we're doing something. And hacking. We were not hopping on computers and crashing websites and breaking into systems. Hacking is crossing somebody's shit out. So that's what we're doing. We're going around hacking people's shit. And at least that's what our name said we were doing. I personally didn't do a lot of that. But there was ample opportunity if one wanted to. Because San Francisco was going through just a graffiti explosion at that time. And it was something that a lot of kids like me... Kids that, you know, we weren't gangbanging. We weren't uh, overt criminal yet. Like, some of us turned that route. But we weren't doing all that. Like, we weren't, we were just little kids. But we were still more street conscious, more street wise, more street orientated. And thus more prone to activities in the street. And this is a time before the internet. This is And this is a time before social media, before cell phones, like... If you wanted action at something, it was outside. You didn't, you might call your friends and be like, hey, what's up, dude? Like, can I come over? If you were really cool with somebody, you could just go to their house and just fucking whistle. Like, they'll see you, hey, what's up, fool? Like, hey, come inside. It was like that. And hey, what you want to do? Fuck it, man. Let's just go outside and bus hop. Jump from bus to bus and just go see the city. Like, in San Francisco, you can get on a bus and end up anywhere in the city. And maybe like it might max like an hour if traffic is really stupid and you're downtown at an hour, but it doesn't take long. You can end up anywhere. And we would go on those little like uh, exploration trips and shit even before we started tagging. So while while all this is going on, like I said, San Francisco is experiencing a graffiti boom. Our generation, we get caught up in it. So my friend Ed he tells me, he's like, hey, what's up, man? Like, we got this crew. We got this other crew. But, you know, you can join this one, though, this smaller one, this newer one. 
I was like, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm down, man. I'm, I'm trying to tag. And I'd never tagged before. Like, we used to, when we would ride the J Church, on some of the, the older styles of train, there was this circular kind of big window right next to the driver's area. So there's a driver's area on both sides of the train. That way they don't have to turn the shit around. They go to the end of the tracks and just turn their, you know, walk to the other side and ride their ass out. So they can do that. That window, we, you know, somebody, I don't remember the first person that did it, but I remember somebody being like, hey, it's your turn. And uh, I saw that person punch the window. I was like, oh, shit. And um, it didn't break, but it just shattered. And that became almost like a little trademark of our little crew when we would ride the train together after school. Somebody's got to do it. And even like it got to the point where I would just do it. Like I would just, psh, that, that was just like procedure. I'm getting off the train, cool. I'm going to punch that shit. I'm going to go about my business. Stop doing it when a dude grabbed me and I had to run and I got chased and shit. But since I was already like graffiti adjacent, vandalism adjacent, making the leap to doing graffiti wasn't that big of a deal for me. So I had to come up with the name. I didn't get jumped in. It's not like I had to fight anybody to join. It was basically like, these guys are already my friends anyway, so fuck it. Do you want to be a part of it? Yes. All right. Well, I'm in. I remember, like I said, I, I fucked with some rock. And then later, that's all I listened to. For like around that same time, even though I was doing graffiti and shit and I was in the streets and shit, I would say, fuck it, man, I'm gonna listen to punk rock or I'm gonna listen to this, I'm gonna listen to that. I got kind of tired of everybody expecting me just to listen to this when, fuck that, man, I feel like just doing whatever I wanna do. And the Smashing Pumpkins had a song out called Zero. And I was like, man, I think that'd be a cool name. So that became my name, Zero or ZR. That was my first one. And when ed told me like hey if you you know you want to join you got to go hit up like you got to go hit up you got to go put put the crew up somewhere i said all right man i'm about to go do that so my mom she worked sundays she worked sundays and she got up for work super early she got up for work like 4 30 4 45 in the morning she'd be out the door by like 5 30 she'd be at work at six so i knew that if i wanted to do this and get away with it i had to do it early I wasn't going to be able to do it late, but, you know, if I got my ass out of bed this Sunday when my mom was at work, I could go bust that move. So I got up, it was like seven something, and I went up to Holly Park, and there's this green building. I don't know if it's a bathroom. I don't know what the fuck it is. I remember it being there, but the backside of this green building faces Holly Courts, and I was like, I want everybody to see my shit, so that's where I'm going to hit up. I had a, a shoe polish applicator, and for those that don't know, that could be used as like like a marker, basically. Like you can hit up with that, and because they leak, sometimes it looks cool. You could use that, and you could use it on a bus, bus full of people, and the smell isn't going to give it away. If nobody's looking at you, people might not even know that you did it. And also, if the the cops happen to see me, and we're like, "Hey, what the fuck are you doing over here?" and they check me. All they'd see is shoe polish. And I could probably come up with some bullshit for having shoe polish. But for having a big pilot or a big ass marker or SG or like one of those uh, diamond tip eschers, the scribers that we used to use to uh, carve into glass, I would have no explanation for that. Shoe polish maybe though. So I was trying to think as uh, strategically as 12-year-old Connor could, which is still kind of but not really. I go up there, and in the biggest letters I could, I write zero PBH. And I felt pretty proud of myself. I felt proud. I was like, yeah, I did that. You know, I did that shit. And, and uh, the next day, I saw Ed at school. And he was like, hey, what's up? I need to talk to you. I was like, yeah, what's up? And he said, hey, everybody saw that shit. I was like, all right, that's what's up. He was like, yeah, you know, they say you did that, but that shit was trash. Like, that shit was whack. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing. And he was like, yeah, I know. Like, every, everybody can tell. So that's why they're going to get me to, like, kind of show you how to write. And, you know, shout out to Ed. Despite his best efforts, I, I never was all ever that good. But I had a lot of heart. I, I would say I had a lot of heart. 
And really, from that day on, I was obsessed. I covered pretty much everything I owned in graffiti. Like, I would, every, like, little book or notebook or my backpack or anything, it was just covered in fucking graffiti. And I, every time I left the house, I tagged. It almost kind of like, you know, like Gurkhas. So, (laughs) it's kind of a crazy analogy, but for those that don't know, there are soldiers from Nepal that are called Gurkhas. And I believe most of them come from the Gurkha people. So, these are some of the most, like, elite special forces on Earth. They go, they go in when shit is really bad. And they exclusively work for the United Kingdom's military. They get deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever. They get respect. Fools don't really want to... Fools don't want to see them. And they have these, like, really big knives called uh, kukris. The, uh, they have... I don't know if this is real or not, but part of the Gurkha mythology is if they pull a, a kukri out... They can't put it back until they stab or slash somebody with that shit. So they'll swing it. You know, it's not going back in the sheath. But it's like, hey, what if the battle ends? Like, you got to, like, stab a homeboy or a corpse or yourself? Like, how do you... You just got to be the dude with the knife until the next battle? Like, how does that shit work? But whenever I left the house, I wasn't coming back home without tagging. And I started doing my little expeditions. We go out to the avenues. We go out to the Richmond. We go out to uh, Sunset sometimes. We go out to West Portal. We go everywhere. Anywhere that had buses, we were on them. And I went through a couple of name changes. I was, yeah, Zero zero wasn't the one. The one after that wasn't the one. Uh, I came up with a cool one. That wasn't for too long because somebody else had it. And my last one that I had was uh, I went by Harm. And I was in a crew called MBK. And that was a citywide crew. That had some respected writers in it. That was uh, that was the peak of my career, if you want to call it that. But tagging was everything to me. Graffiti was everything to me. I started documenting it. I started taking pictures. There was uh, a website at that time that was called Hi-Fi Art. And it documented San Francisco graffiti fabulously. Like it was, it was an amazing website. I knew the guy that ran the website. He went to my high school, but he was a senior. And if you guys ever see the Rebel 8 clothing line, he's the guy that created that. It's a guy named Josh D. He was the fucking man. Like, I was a very annoying fucking kid. Like, anytime I would see that dude on AOL, I, oh, I'd be on his line heavy. Like, hey, what's up, Josh? What's cracking, man? Hey, did you see this? You hear about this shit? You hear about this shit? You hear about that? Like, I'd be on him. And one time he actually just had to straight up tell me, like, hey, dude, like, you got to fucking give me some space. Like... Don't just hit me up the first time, like, you see me. And it's like, 13-year-old Connor was very overzealous. Like, like, like I said, I'm not coming home unless I'm tagging. I'm tagging everywhere I go. If I'm on the bus, unless I'm with a family member, like, yeah, obviously, I'm not going to tag in front of my mom. Like, that's fucking stupid. But I couldn't tag with my sister around because she would tell on me. And uh, that would be giving her an easy one. So, no, nah, I wouldn't tag if she was around. But any other time, if I'm by myself, if I'm with... One of the guys, yeah, I'm tagging. And a similar overzealousness because I perceive Josh to be a very organized, talented guy, which he was. It's, it's evident. Like, you get Little Wayne and all these other guys wearing your clothes. You know, you know what the fuck you're doing. And he, he was trying to give me game at that time. I just couldn't understand it. But he documented the best writers in the city. So, and there was, there was a lot of them. There's guys like Chief, Butter, uh, guys that weren't even from San Francisco, like Saber and AWR, MSK, those crews, THR, Twist, um, Reminisce. Like, there's so many people that were so talented. Cycle, like my homeboy C4, like, so talented. Uh, they could have been doing anything anywhere on earth art wise and been making a lot of money off it. And I remember thinking at the time, seeing all these super just advanced technical artists with these huge pieces, the murals would be, some of those murals would be huge. Like in the thumbnail of this video, you see the piece there by Ty, rest in peace. But those pieces were everywhere. Like you could hit yards. Like I used to go to, or I would like going to the uh, Coors Yard that was over there off uh, Army, now Cesar Chavez. Going back there, seeing all the pieces. Um, right by Wallenberg, 
I forget the name of the street, but it's right there by USF. There was a little like kind of overpass and it was almost like a cave back there. There were a lot of pieces back there too. I would take them all in. I would watch them. I would see other writers when they would get on the buses and they would do their things. And there was just a lot of different dynamics at that time. And there was a lot of different things to consider. So as a, as a young kid, a young observant kid, I, I took them all in. So this is what was going on at the time. Now, first is uh, you can almost say the, the different levels of tagging or the different worlds. Definitely, I would have been considered a toy. <laughs> and that is, that is like the, the absolute lowest level. I was up, though. You could at least say that about me. I remember there was a guy named Sav. And um, like we, were, we would say that back in the day. Like People talk about being a savage and stuff like that. We were saying that shit early to mid-90s, possibly even before. I just don't remember. But Sav, like, we'd be, oh, that fool's a Sav. I'm a Sav. I'm Saving. So Sav, he would tag on uh, garbage cans. Like, we got these public, you know, garbage cans. Nobody fucking uses them in San Francisco. They just throw their shit on the street. But he would hit those up. And he was citywide. And if you're citywide, you still kind of had to respect it, even if he was, uh, even if he was whack. And I'm not going to really say he was whack, because I was whack. So who the fuck am I to talk? But uh, he wasn't an elite guy. So we had our world. We had the world of the toys, almost. And the world of the guys that tagged on buses. Versus the guys that did pieces. And those were two different things, but they intersected. A lot of the guys that did pieces, like I would see uh, Butter, I would see his, uh, you know, he was from a crew called ICP, Inner City Funk. Uh, I would see his stickers on the bus. It was dope. Like he was really, really dope. He would he would be hitting up in the Excelsior, in the Mission. So I'd be in those, you know, I'd be in those areas a lot and I'd see him up. I'd see him running. But there was more respect afforded to the guys that were doing pieces. And my friend Ed, he could do really, really good pieces. He's super talented. C4, super talented. Connor McCann, not so much. So I, a lesser form of the piece is called the throw-up. And that's just something... It can have as little as just the outline of like something like a piece. Sometimes it's filled in. You, you know, you can, you can do a throw-up in couple minutes like maybe even less than that but that's as far as i got in terms of uh the techniques so for our world i can't speak on the world of the guys doing pieces i just can't because i wasn't in that realm i have friends in that realm but i wasn't in that realm i thought that they were kids like us i was like damn like at most maybe 17 18 16 like i couldn't see them being any older than that like there was a guy named gray I saw him, he hit a piece on Hate Street. And there's a, a documentary about San Francisco graffiti called Piece by Piece, I believe. He hit a piece on Hate Street on a billboard. And he drug a shopping cart full of graf like spray cans up there. And I was like, damn, how the fuck did he do that? Like, I can barely lift like 30 pounds. How the fuck did he bring that shit up there? Oh, well, one, it turned out that all these people were adults. And these were grown ass people, some of them with art degrees or working towards art degrees. And it's like, well, no wonder they were doing things on, on that level. And it's like, damn, why was I comparing myself to, to grown people? But it's like, I didn't know. And they, they had their own world. Our world was mostly 18 and younger. And it was like, you could just be going out. You're going on a mission every time you went outside. It was like you were going on a quest. You didn't know how you were going to hit up. You didn't know what was going to happen. You don't know if bus drivers are going to call cops. You don't know if the cops are going to already be on. Because sometimes the cops would be riding on the bus undercover. Kids would get busted. Um, shit like that would happen. You never knew. You, didn't, you never knew if someone was going to be a hero. Like a superhero status. Jump up. Like the dude that grabbed me. Like that's being a hero. I remember 40 year old, a uh, 40 year old man beat up a friend of mine on the bus. Over shit like that. And it's like you just never knew. You never knew who you were going to run into also in terms of other riders. Some riders used to jack people. And uh, by jack, I mean they would rob them. So most of us, you know, that was the extent of what we did was just tag. Some of these guys were robbers. And that crew, HTS, 
elements within that crew. That crew got so big. Like, I would see on Cortland Emission, sometimes I would see, like, 50 dudes on each side of the street. Even though I know the guys that started the shit. These guys don't know who I am. I'm just some some white boy. Uh, yeah, it's pocket check time. So they would do that. And if you ran into somebody like that, they see you tag, they might come and take your shit off you. Like, you might, they might act like they're your friend and then just take it from you and be like, do something. Shit like that happens. Stuff, stuff goes on, but also you can meet people and then you guys go tag together. And then maybe you join their crew or your crews combine. Sometimes crews do not get along or sometimes it's just competitive. Like, we want to see who's better. So we're going to battle. And I battled a few times. So I remember when I really first got into graffiti, there was a big, there were two big battles going on. There was FCK versus TK, which was, that was like high level hand styles. So by hand styles, I mean just writing with a marker with some spray paint. That was a big citywide battle. I remember passing by a wall on Hate and Divisadero. One day, it was all FCK'd out. And um, it was just FCK, 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 FCK. The next day when I saw it, every single FCK was crossed out and a TK was put on on top of it. The day after that, every single TK was crossed out and so on and so forth all over the city. I'm not sure who was in TK or where they were really based out of just because I saw them everywhere. But the thing that was notable to a lot of people about FCK at that time was that there were a lot of Samoans in FCK. And that seemed to scare a lot of people. People weren't people weren't playing games with, with the Usos. It just wasn't happening. And um, I can also say, though, if you were cool with somebody, if you're cool with somebody Samoan, you met his family, like, those folks accepted you. You were, you were all good. And it was just like they stuck together. They stuck together. Ultimately, I believe TK won that, though. More locally, HTS had a big battle with FMT. And to the rest of the city, it might not mean much. A lot of people might not even remember it happening. But this was kids all my age. And it was big. And it escalated into something called Funk Battle. Funk battle means we see each other, we fight. It's basically gangbang. There's nobody shooting. A couple of guys have razors or somebody have a knife or something like that. But other than that, it would just be fighting. Like when something's going on so long, there's been everybody's hacking, disrespecting, and maybe somebody got jumped. So that kicked it off. Fuck it. We're going to go jump one of those people. Like that's what, it, that's what it turns into. And this one had gone on long enough and was bad enough that it escalated to that. But ultimately, HDS won and absorbed FMT. And all those guys that were FMT were now HDS. FMT ceased to exist. And this is the same thing that happens with just people. When one people conquers another, the same process happens. Like, they might stay them for a while. But especially in antiquity and times past, a new group comes in, imposes their language, imposes the culture... Unless those people have something very steady that ties them all together, an institution like the church or something of that nature, you can think of uh, the Serbs in, in Serbia during Turkish occupation, Ottoman occupation. That's what kept them Serbs versus becoming Turks. These things still apply to each other. It's still people. And while graffiti is pretty maligned um, by people that don't do it, it's still humans. It's still human beings, and certain things are always going to apply because it's human beings involved. And you wouldn't expect a a lesson or things to learn about group dynamics and especially about uh, ethnogenesis, particularly how groups come to be, how groups cease to be, how new groups are formed. I learned all that stuff subconsciously watching graffiti crews rise and fall. And... Um, you know, when it comes to the battles, I can say that most times it was friendly. Like, I remember being in a battle with a crew, and I was, like, really good friends with one of the guys from that crew. Like, we'd known each other since we were, like, five years old. Like, our moms knew each other. They were going uh, to protest together, labor disputes together. Like, pff, 
there was no way me and him, shout out to Jeff, there was no way that we were ever going to have any problems with each other because fucking no, we've known each other since we were five. Like, come on, man. So we're still battling. I'll still cross his crew out if I see it. It's just not that serious. I mean, another time I was in a, I was in the last battle. Another time I was in the last battle I'd ever be in. We lost that one. Our crew pretty much fell apart. And um, we saw a guy from the other crew. He saw us, shook our hands. What's up? Blah, blah, blah. Talked to him for a while. He hit up with a spray can, like with a spray can on the bus and uh, shook our hands. All right, man, I'll see you guys later. And I asked my homeboy I was with, uh, shout out to the homeboy, Kevin. I was like, hey, uh, should we cross that shit out? And he was like, nah, leave it be. So it was still like, it was competitive, but we were doing this almost because like, man, I'm not trying to be gangbanging. Like, I'm not trying to be fighting over red and blue. I'm not trying to be out here fighting over Norte and Sewer. Like, I I'm not into that. I'm not trying to kill anybody and I'm not trying to get killed. Like, none of this shit appeals to me. But at the same time, it must in some way because I'm doing like the decaf version of it. And those dynamics kind of would reflect each other at times. And sometimes you couldn't tell the difference between them. And some of the people that joined the tagger crews, it, it was almost like they graduated to gangbanging afterwards. And for me, when I stopped, it was more like I stopped doing everything. It's that terrible period in my life. Um, where just everything fell apart. Like I was doing some criminal shit too. And I stopped doing that because I just didn't care anymore. Like I just didn't care about anything. And it took me about seven years to recover from that. And by the time, by the time I did recover from it, I was in my twenties. I wasn't going to go back out and hit up on walls and shit. I still have the appreciation for it. I still look back at those times and Think of those times pretty fondly. Like, yeah, it was some fucked up shit to do. Like, especially, you know, we used to tag on people's houses. Like, we, were, we, we shouldn't do shit like that. And we kind of knew it. But ultimately getting up and getting seen and getting, you know, it, it, like getting up, you'd be up for like a day max. Like, if you really hit something, like, I remember tagging damn near every surface of like the back of the M ones. We were <laughs> passing through West Portal. And in West Portal, I don't know if they still got them, or at least the tunnels leading up from um, Forest Hill and Castro Station, especially between Forest Hill and West Portal, there's a lot of pieces in there. I don't know if those are still around. I haven't lived in the city for five years now, so no fucking clue. But we would go back there, and the trains, when they would pass back there, they'd be dark. So you could just... So I crushed a train like that with a friend of mine once, and people got to see it for like a day. They're like, damn, y'all did that, y'all did that. that. That was the point. That's, that's what we live for, was y'all did that, or you did that, or damn, I saw you up, I saw you running. You're running citywide. I was over here, and I still saw you running. I was all the way across town, and I saw you up. That's what we live for. That's what I live for. Ultimately, I'm very glad that uh, I, channel, I channel just that energy somewhere else. I'm not just getting on the 24 every day and tagging. I'm not just getting on the 49 every day and tagging. I'm not getting on the 48 to go take that to the 49, to take it to the 24. Like, taking four buses to get home just so you can tag every bus, kind of stupid. I used to do shit like that, but uh, it would take me, like, fucking an hour to get from 24th and Castro home just because I can, I can go down here. I can hit this. I can hit this. Oh, I could put up a sticker here. I could do that. I got to watch for the cops because they kind of trip over here. Like, that, that was my everything. So I'm glad I'm channeling that elsewhere, namely into this podcast and into my book, which will be coming out soon. But perhaps, you know, this is this is a topic that's very broad. I didn't expect to talk about it for this long, but, um, you know, I'm glad I came into this one without a plan. And I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Like I said, I might have to revisit this and just um, do some more thinking, do some more uh, just, you know, understanding and thinking about some more concepts from that time because I'd love to talk about it again. But I hope you guys enjoyed listening. This has been Connor McCann. This has not been Brain Drain, but thank you for listening all the same.